coming along, uh, I realised the second day of, of the conference, people are starting to feel a little bit fatigued, especially probably after your last night. Um, so um, the session today is going to focus on designing a, a global support program for a community of expatriates uh, in a company called uh, Barilla. Uh, I don't know, uh, has anyone heard of Barilla? Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's great. You already have fans. Uh, we hope. Thank you so much. Quite comfortable for the music. Um, for me, uh, uh, my name is David Tricky. Um, work for an organization uh, called TCO International. We do developing uh, global people. Uh, today, we brought along the client, which is always terribly risky on these occasions. Not because the client is not great, it's because, you know, these are always delicate uh, relationships sometimes. But I, I, I kind of wanted to come here in a spirit of uh, vulnerability with you to show a kind of work in progress uh, that, that we have uh, with this particular company. It was always very, very exciting um, for me to be able to work with an iconic brand like Barilla. I, I checked it last night uh, on the internet and, and it's um, the sixth most famous brand uh, in Italy uh, where number one is, I'm afraid, Ferrari. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a tough one to beat. But uh, I mean it's a major brand. Uh, everyone knows it. And, and when I arrived in Italy in 1980, the first thing I bought in the supermarket was a packet of uh, Mulino Bianco biscuits, and you know they've been with me ever since. So you know it's part of my life, and I think what my colleagues are going to say here it's uh, it's part of many people's lives in Italy, and we hope as a result of this, uh, part of many more people's lives uh, around the world. Um, I'm going to be uh, we're going to be doing this session with some of the protagonists I involved in in the project. Um, myself, I, I have the role of kind of. A project architect, if you like, creating the blueprint for this particular um, uh, platform is what we call it. Um, a key player uh, who came in slightly later, and we'll explain why she came in uh, to basically save our lives on this project, uh, uh, is um, Marianna Amy Crestani, who is known as MAC, uh, M-A-C. Yeah. She's now known as just MC, which is Mission Control. So when we basically say, you know, we have a problem, Houston, this is the person that kind of deals with it all. Uh, uh, then we have uh, Lamberto Pranti here, uh, who is uh, uh, now the head of internal communication, and um, also corporate social responsibility within uh, the Barilla group, but has now taken on the role also uh, within his uh, uh, various activities of responsible for this particular uh, project. So he's relatively new to the project, but um, we're going to ask him to uh, talk a little bit about Barilla and talk a little bit about the results uh, that, uh, that came out of the whole thing. So, a little bit of the presentation flow here. Uh, this is the kind of situation which uh, I think many people face uh, as an expatriate within uh, Barilla. Um, you know, welcome to Barilla, you'll soon find your way around and this poor little expatriate arrived. So, <clears throat> we're going to explain how the whole thing started. Actually, the story, we're going to try and tell you a story, it's a little bit of a journey. Some good things happen, some less good things happen. I'm going to try to be pretty honest about what went on here. We're going to uh, ask uh, Lamberto to give you a, a, a quick intro to Barilla, and we're going to show you the uh, little clip from the corporate video there, just to give you a flavor historically of where the company has been, and then perhaps look at where the company needs to go in the future. Um, we tried to explore the expat experience, and we'll talk a little bit about the survey we did at the beginning in order to understand what to do. What happened as a result of the survey was that we identified five challenges. Uh, that expatriates faced within the organization. Uh, and then a little bit about the development of the Global Players platform, and that's where uh, Marianna comes in, in kind of understanding how all the pieces of the jigsaw uh, fit together on this project. Uh, the key, if you like, to this was the coaching network of um, 10, no, I'm not, 10 um, people like yourself, and we have some of them here, so they're going to maybe just say, say one sentence each about how how they participated in this, uh, in this process. 
Um, the control panel uh, behind any complex project uh, is inevitably kind of uh, an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. Uh, and again, the maestro of the Excel spreadsheet is over there to talk a bit about how the whole project was held together. Uh, recently, uh, we did a, a satisfaction survey to find out you know, how we're doing in, in meeting the five challenges. And so we'll share some of the results of that. Uh, and uh, as a result of uh, all of this, uh, quite recently, um, this particular project was uh, given the HR Innovation Award uh, by the Polytechnico in, in, in Milan. So it was a kind of nice little bonus at the end of all of this for, for everyone who worked really hard on it. And now, then there's the future going, going virtual uh, on this whole thing. So uh, we're going to just mention where this project might, might be going. So really, it, it's a run through a holistic uh, project, uh, a little bit from beginning to end. I just want to start with uh, the, um, where it all started. And it started in the biggest uh, pasta factory in Italy, which is here, which you kind of see from the motorway as you're driving up to Milan from Bologna, where I live. Uh, and in this room here uh, was the first meeting. I, I always kind of remember this uh, first meeting on the 18th of January, 2010, uh, because, well, I, I was feeling kind of cool at that time. I had quite a, a number of contracts going on, and um, I, I was feeling quite relaxed in going into, into the client. I kind of wasn't desperate for business, if you like, so... I thought, well, you know, let's try and build a different kind of relationship uh, with the client. And so I, I thought, well, let's play the trust card. I mean, one of my other areas of interest is how do we build trust across cultures? And so I thought, well, you know, let's consciously try to build right from the beginning a relationship of trust uh, with, the, with the customer in this situation. And so, you know, I had a kind of jamming session uh, with the then head of, of uh, leadership and development with the idea that behind the relationship I wanted was a partnership with this company. You know, I wanted us to grow together, to learn together, to make mistakes together, uh, and I didn't want to feel uh, in this particular client situation like a pure supplier uh, that they could kind of cross off their list or Christmas card list or something like that. So I thought, you know, if you have a supplier and you have trust, you have a partnership. And so I thought, well, let's try to uh, initiate a trust-based relationship. So a few things happened in that first meeting. So I kind of said, okay, let's make no assumptions about the expat community that, uh, that we, uh, you would like us perhaps to look at as, as Project A. Uh, we're going to simply ask the expatriates. And so let's start with a, a very detailed, rigorous uh, survey to explore what expatriate, uh, what expatriates were going through, what those who had come back, uh, had experience, uh, uh, and to get a picture of what the challenges really were that faced us. So that was, if you like, our needs analysis there. And the pricing was a bit, we had a session the uh, day before yesterday on, on pricing. Um, we decided to do a kind of interesting pricing, which we're now using with lots of other uh, clients, but Barilla was the first one um, to have an in all-inclusive uh, fixed fee per um, per expatriate, uh, and this would be a two-year contract. So in other words, you're with us for two years, you're paying that amount for each expatriate, and that included some research and development funding. So we kind of had our own budget. Uh, and the idea was uh, we wouldn't give any breakdown of individual service, but we would make this uh, future-proof. By future-proof, what I mean is that I don't know what in our organization we're going to have next week, never mind next year, but wouldn't you, as an organization, like to have what we will have next year? Uh, and so what I wanted to say is whatever we learn, whatever tools we have, we will give that, we will put that into the mix. So in other words, we have a constantly beta state, state of, of relationship we were, which we are having uh, together. So it was 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and we had the budget to be able to put that in. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also said there is no limit to the consulting time. So, you know, if you need us to go up the road to, to, to Parma, we'll come up every day of the week if it's necessary. Uh, the trust with the client is you will not call us every day of the week <laughs> so that we have to go, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it allows a huge amount of flexibility uh, and intensity uh, of involvement. 
rather than the, you know, the usual, this is by daily rate, this is uh, uh, you know, a kind of menu that you can tick off or say, no, we're having budget cuts, we'll cut that this year. And we also said, Let, let's challenge each other. Um, and I think when you have trust between people, you start to challenge each other. And that's where innovation comes in the relationship uh, between suppliers mm, plus trust equals ability to challenge each other. And when we challenged each other uh, in pretty tough discussions sometimes about what we could and couldn't do, because we challenged each other, we were actually able to become quite committed to the decisions that we made together because we've both been involved or all been involved in this tough debate together. And that allowed us to all to focus on ultimately uh, the main goal, which was to, uh, to Barilla and to the expatriate community. So we also said, let's try and challenge the status quo. I mean, we all know kind of what everybody else is doing in, in managing expatriates uh, and relocation services and things like that. Uh, uh, let's, let's try and raise the bar a little bit. Let's do some things which are different uh, and explore uh, new frontiers in, in approaching this particular challenge. And uh, the, the most exciting thing was, let's make this a foundation for actually internationalizing the whole organization. So let's use this as a laboratory and potentially let's identify the expat community as potentially change agents for the internationalization of the whole, of the whole organization. So, you know, we had a really kind of exciting time and I said to Marta Luca, who was the head of leadership development at the time, I said, hey, what do you think about this? And she said, okay, can you draft an expat survey by the end of today? And I said, well, maybe tomorrow. And, I, you know, wow, things were moving really quickly uh, within, within this organization. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I know this doesn't exist. Uh, well, you'll pretend, won't you? Old habits die hard. But we, we kind of, we went through, uh, we went through this. I don't know if expats go through it or not, but we went through this. So we had the kind of before uh, leaving on the project experience. We had a wonderful honeymoon period where we hugged a lot. Um, and then, unfortunately, we had a crisis time. And then I think we're in a state of uh, adaptation at the moment in this particular uh, program. So we're going to look a little bit at that. But I'd like to now uh, offer uh, Lamberto uh, a couple of minutes now just to kind of give you uh, 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 an insight, if you like, into Barilla. Thank and then you. I'll click the button uh, so, on the film. So, thank you, David. I don't know if I can add some more value to what uh, David said. Difficult. So, my role here is uh, to establish and to clarify a fact, just one fact. It's so important to me. That is, uh, <laughs> is the increase of uh, the dramatic increase that will take place in Estonia and in your <laughs> the business. So please taste one of them. <laughs> First is for you. So. I'm joking, but I'm not completely joking, in the sense that uh, everything must be uh, regarded as a tool, as an instrument, maybe a little bit sophisticated and uh, uh, of high level to increase our business. And since we are starting up uh, as an international company, I'd rather prefer to remember you that uh, Barilla is the worldwide leader in pasta, the leader in baking products in Europe and in sources, and is developing even in the new countries, in the BRICS, in Latin America and Asia. And so my role is the, to stay closer to uh, David and to Mariana and to the CEO uh, network in order to improve this project where I entered just six months ago. Uh, so. I, I would like to provide some flavor of the Barilla culture, looking at a, a very short film, a part of it, that is the corporate film of Barilla. I'm fully available at the end of the speech, end of the session, to answer the many questions you have. <laughs> <laughs> the first Barilla factory was opened in 1910 the same year in which the first trademark was registered, marking the beginning of our industrial history. 
The Second World War brought the country to its knees. The Badilla family and its employees rolled up their sleeves and, during the post-war period, the company managed to become Italy's leader in the pasta market. The economic boom of the 50s and 60s then opened a new growth phase and, in 1969, the company built what is still the world's largest pasta plant. with a capacity of 1,000 tons per day right outside Parma. The Molino Bianco brand was born in 1975, a new line of bakery products that became so popular to change Italians' breakfast habits. During those years, the ownership of Barilla changed hands, moving under the control of the American firm Grace, but it didn't last long. In 1979, thanks to Pietro Barilla's bravery, the company returned in Italian hands. Communication has always been our strong point. From the first packaging for pasta in the 1950s, to the pioneering advertisements featuring famous testimonials, like Italian singer Mina, playwright Dario Fa, and even an ad signed by director Federico Fellini. Barilla was soon associated with pasta, with Italian cuisine, with the Italian family. More of the same recipe was used outside Italy. Paul Newman, Cindy Crawford, Placido Domingo, Steffi Graf, and Gerard Depardieu brought Barilla pasta around the world. In the late 90s, Barilla became Europe's market leader. By the new millennium, we were number one even in the United States. We've grown over time. We now have 135 years of experience behind us and 30 plants worldwide. Okay, well done. So, that was Barilla's history, but the future is challenging, extremely challenging. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, actually, Lamberto, do you, do you want to comment a little bit on, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. on this? Okay. I mean, that's strategy. I don't do company strategy, you do that. <laughs> so, Barilla is a family company. It is not quoted on the stock exchange market. So, in order to find out the financial resources, we have to focalize our businesses in rather few areas. We started up, of course, with Italy in the 50s, in the, in the 60s, then becoming the Italian leader. It was the same story regarding Europe in the 80s and the 90s. And now, the new frontier, after having some way conquered the United States, where we have a 30% market share in pasta, we are trying to approach those very promising market, markets represented by China, by Brazil, by uh, Australia, by Japan, uh, and Latin America. This is the last uh, uh, challenge we have. Uh, the next, sorry, the next challenge we have. This is an interview, is a piece of an interview of our chairman, Guido Barilla, uh, talking about our things, our thinking about China and Brazil, where we are establishing businesses. Uh, at the moment, there are not uh, uh, production centers. We are, simply, we are simply selling our products, importing them from Italy. But never say never, uh, according to what uh, is uh, my experience, wherever you will establish uh, and we will establish a, a, a certain critic mass of the business, maybe we will enter even with production sector. That's all. Okay. And then the thank challenge, you. thank you, Amerto, the challenge that uh, has been set to the organization is by 2020 to double sales. And that's not going to come from Europe. Mm -hmm. That's going to come from all the new uh, emerging markets. And of course, you have an organization which is fundamentally, at its core, not only Italian, but it's Parma-based, yeah? You know, originally, I, I would say originally quite provincial. Uh, and so who is going to actually build those markets? Who is going to go out there and, and pioneer those markets? Who is going to be selling? Who is going to be reporting back to headquarters? And the people, of course, at, 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 the, at the front line of that are going to be the expatriates uh, who are going out there exploring those markets. And they'll be coming back with all of that knowledge, which we want them to bring back to the organization. So that's why these, 
this expat community is such an important one. As you can see, you know, where they're located around the world at the moment, that's where their expatriates are located, and that was the challenge to support these people uh, across the globe. Okay, we conducted at the beginning, as I said, uh, an expatriate survey in order to find out what the critical challenges were. Uh, we managed to find 36 people who responded to a 74-question survey. I mean, that was a, a big thing to ask people to do. We got a 92% redemption from people. That was already a sign that this is important and I want to give my voice uh, on, on this particular issue. Um, we got lots and lots of data. It's not particularly interesting itself, uh, you know, but we looked at past expatriates as well as current expa expatriates as well. So those who had come back, reflected on their experience and said, you know, we, we should have had perhaps something different. Uh, we broke those down into various areas from everything from pre-departure to the situation with the partner and the family, onboarding, uh, support on the assignment itself, repatriation, overall experience, uh, HR packages, absolutely everything. So we work with HR to produce not just a cultural survey, but a complete uh, checklist of issues there. And we found there were five challenges broadly coming out. And those challenges have guided us over the last few years on, on this particular project. So challenge number one that we found was that we had to build a positive perception within the whole organization that being an international player was a good thing to do and not a career damaging move where you would disappear off the map uh, and never kind of come back and your chair will be so cold that when you came back it probably even wasn't there any longer. So we wanted people in the organization like in this cartoon here to aspire to, to being an expatriate or, or at least being part of the international process within the organization. We found lots of indicators for all of these challenges. You know, there was a low perception that international experience was valued in a leadership role, for example. There were plenty of others. And what we did is we looked for these indicators in the questionnaire. Uh, and, you know, we had the output from the questionnaire. That linked into the challenge that we needed to have uh, a deal with. We had some objectives that we had in order to deal with that challenge. And then we moved towards some positive uh, some possible actions that we could take to respond to those challenges. So we did that for each of the five. The second challenge was this. Um, challenge two was how to build readiness for global uh, deployment in the organization. I mean, little cross-cultural preparation was, provide, uh, was provided, although it was perceived as being uh, useful. Um, Post-arrival training uh, was, was perceived to be uh, inadequate to meet the challenges that they were facing in the early stages and about 25% admitted real difficulties in adapting to the new cultural context in which they were operating. I mean I have to sort of say that uh, Italy is not uh, necessarily a country that focuses in perhaps like Germany in such a sy systematic way on a response to um, you know cultural diversity issues and supporting expatriates. So I mean not a lot was done, but I can tell you, since we work with about nine of the main Italian companies in Italy, um, that was pretty, pretty normal, you know, in terms of responses to, to, to expatriation. Challenge number three was, uh, of course, uh, how to ensure that people uh, had a, a good start-up process in, in going abroad, uh, preferably before departure, and that we were preparing people for re-entry. We did a lot of conversations with people who I believe are experts in, in the re-entry process, PhD students on re-entry. We wanted to try and understand how best to respond to this very challenging issues. Uh, very few had onboarding programs, inadequate assistance with a partner and things like that were coming out. Challenge number four was interesting. It was how to keep international assignees connected to their home country while they're away, so how can you be present when you are absent? Um, the magical requirement to be in two places at the same time. Uh, probably not physically, but how spiritually can you still have a presence in the organization when you're away in another country? Uh, and there was a perception that while they were abroad, they were less present, less visible, and less connected to the headquarters. So they began to disappear. They began to go off the radar, uh, and that was problematic for the first challenge was people didn't want to be international because that would damage your career. 
And then, of course, there was challenge five, which was how can we recognize uh, and value the international assignees uh, on their return? And it wasn't necessarily getting wonderful jobs. Sometimes <laughs> the, the simple thing they wanted was people to be interested in them when they came back talking of sto wonderful stories of how they did this and that. Uh, but nobody was really interested. It's just, you know, do you want to have another cup of coffee or something like that? So the poor guys, they were kind of getting ignored for what value they were bringing back into the organization. So there's frustration uh, about sharing hard-won experience uh, that they had uh, on return. Low interest, low encouragement in bringing that experience back and repurposing that experience uh, for the organization. So those were the kind of five challenges that held us together on the project there. And from then, we kind of, yes, so that's me. Actually, that's my job. Um, you know, ensuring global success, we had uh, basically three things that we had to focus on. Uh, supporting the expats before, during, and after their return. Uh, re re leadership realignment, so we realized that these people were going to need to lead in a different way when they were operating in these new contexts. And of course, sharing and retaining that very hard-won uh, knowledge on, on their return. So we put together a kind of blended learning and development platform, we call it. Um, uh, uh, we use the international profiler before they left. Uh, this is a world work product. Uh, we did some intercultural workshops for the whole expatriate community to build community. These were people who never actually met. You know, they all went in their fragmented places, but they never actually met as a community. So we brought them back together from all over the world for a couple of days to kind of celebrate being that community. Uh, E-learning modules, uh, development plans, distance coaching sessions, which was absolutely the kind of core of the whole thing. Uh, we develop country-specific briefings, and we're starting now to build a web community within this group of people. One of these things was the global forum that we started off. Uh, we invited all of the expatriates, so we had 40 people there from the expatriate community. But we also inv invited another 50 people from the organization who were key players in the organization working internationally. So we wanted to bring both communities together. We didn't want to create a ghetto of, uh, of expatriates. Uh, and so we wanted them also to have visibility back in the organization. We've run a couple of these now, and they also get involved as expatriates in uh, strategic debates in the organization. Like last year, we did one on should we be calling uh, Barilla uh, the Italian food company? Is that a benefit to you abroad, or is that a barrier because you're called the Italian food company? And so we had a whole day workshop, and these are people who know how the organization is perceived abroad. That information was passed on to a committee which was then presented to the board. So you start influencing the top of the organization and you feel valued as a result of it. So we did these workshops here, you know, where we did sort of simulations with them, the usual culture shock activities. We had the great David Lewis, which some of you recognize from various intercultural books by Mr. Hampton Turner and, uh, and von Strompenas. Uh, he came along and did sort of quick drawings to capture these experiences so that we could also give them a kind of visual souvenir uh, of the whole experience there. Uh, we did world cafes on, on issues from expatriates, which then would be fed up to, to, to HR. Uh, and of course, at the end of every day, I would say, can you sum this up in one sentence? Uh, <laughs> blank faces. Then. We, we, we also, using the international profiler, which is an individual coaching tool to look at 22 international competencies, we could look at the aggregate profile of, of this whole community of expatriates. So we wanted to kind of see what kind of international animal are we as an expatriate community. And I'm not going to explain any of that, but basically what we could see here, I mean, one of the great things, interesting things that came out is they were giving so little energy to sensitivity to context, which is fundamentally, uh, they were not giving sufficient energy to exploring uh, power, uh, decision making, and informal networks within the organization. And as you know, if you're an expatriate and you don't have a good network when you leave, you can leave and you become... Um, uh, kind of uh, dissected as a result uh, of going abroad. 
So we knew also uh, what we needed to focus on. So we had a development plan for the expat community as a whole as a result of doing this kind of x-ray uh, on their approach to being uh, international. So that was a wonderful honeymoon period. We'd done the first global forum. You know, the, uh, Marta Luca was so happy with it, great hugs, and you know, we felt good about the whole thing. But that lasted about two days. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, crisis time. Yeah, the truth is a bit narrow. The case now, so we've got to wrap up everything in five minutes uh, and on a magnetic control name. Yes, it was the crisis when actually I, I came in um, in the project. But um, I felt that it was, you know, one of those projects that you actually end up loving. Uh, but it was a make it and break it. The level of tension at the very first meeting that I went to was extremely high. Why? Because we had this vision. We, wanted, we knew where we wanted to go. But we had also to support it with a series of hard facts. Hard facts. We had, we had the vision, but we had to support it with hard facts. So we had to... We had a full immersion of seven days to, to mainly prepare all of this. We broke the assignment period of two years into three moments which are the three key moments of an assignment, before departure, during the assignment, at, and at the entry. Each of these moments, which are the key moments of an expatriate's life, were also linked to a series of tools. So these experts were going to do the international profiler before leaving, have a coaching session on the results of the international profiler before leaving, and also get an insight into the country of their target of their destination. Then they were going to be supported with one distance coaching session every two months throughout the whole assignment and have a yearly forum, but also engage in a series of e-learning modules which were partly due to the fact that we wanted to create a common language to talk about international challenges. And finally, we wanted to support them at the re-entry, linking back to the five challenges that we had identified were the core challenges for Borrego's expats. We developed a series of customized tools, so country briefing booklets, an awful lot of work, with links, hyperlinks, but also, as you can see here, we wanted to create a sense of community. So mainly indicating expats from the Borrego um, platform which had already been in that target uh, destination who could mentor people who were going there. And using other tools such as Argonaut to do a value comparison, so where I stand as an Italian compared to the Chinese value system, and integrate that with the international profiler more on an individual level. Uh, so all of this was, was set and then also create a resource pack, which is divided into eight chapters, which mainly touches the key challenges of an expat. So, for example, you know, culture shock, what it means to, to move the family, children and everything. But the real key element of all this was the coaching team. Because my, my key task here was mainly to make sure that this coaching team would communicate with the, coach, with the coaches, but also be aware of what the client's needs were. So we put together this amazing team, and one of, uh, we've got some, some coaches here, who mainly also had this incredible ability of capturing those you know, risky things that were going on in the target destinations, which most of the time's headquarters was totally unaware of. So they could capture these needs, and we, we would report it back to headquarters. Yeah, which is actually that slide there, which is they fed it all in. So we managed to get a sensitivity to the collective expat issues so that we could flag those up in the organization without breaking individual con uh, uh, confidences. And that became a kind of early warning signal from the far reaches of the empire, uh, where normally these people were completely off the radar. So it connected them to the organization and the organization to them. Yeah, and through them we also managed to develop a coaching culture within Gorilla, but also to, in order to make sure that the, there was a communication flow between these coaches, the clients, the people, we communicated a lot through this uh, newsletter. The newsletter had the task of focusing on a key issue, 
doing collecting an interview to an expat with a country focus, and then on the third page, remember and remind all the key players involved in the project of the next step. For example, the next coaching session, there's a new e-learning module available, there's a new article on topic X. And that was a way through which we could involve and inform. And it was given to the whole of the Barilla group. So the Barilla group was began, becoming to getting to understand the lives of the expatriates, what they were going through, why they were valuable. And so again, it was part of the internationalization process. And one of the key elements here was, again, to make sure that all these key players were connected. So we had a process, but we also wanted to ensure that the particular needs of the individuals and of the, of the countries of the countries were also followed. And through, and this is one of the examples of the these databases that I created, which were also a way of making sure that the client knew that we were honouring the very first contract based on trust, so we were doing things. We were actually, you know, keep it running. And, and they could also access, they can access, some non-confidential um, feedbacks on the coaching sessions, so that they also have a sense of what is going on. So at the end, after all of this work, we actually did find a new balance, which was confirmed with, um, from an evaluation of personnel which we did at the end of last week, or last year, sorry, which proved the fact that in actual fact, the project was successful. Most of the people liked it, excellent, very good support, but there were some, still some things, key things that we had to cover. I mean, it's not all wonderful. <laughs> uh, one of the key elements which we still need and um, that we're focusing on is how actually to make sure that the, the, these experts, when they come back, they're actually valued. How do we actually make sure that they are connected to headquarters? So it's very much of an ongoing project. Absolutely, and we're still kind of stuck with some deep-rooted challenges. You can't change an organizational culture. So just to finish off, you know, this is some of the stuff that's really sort of going on. You know, you get these expatriates, says, you know, I have killed the dragon out there, and I want to tell you my story. And what do they do? They say, oh, very nice, dear. <laughs> uh, I have that kind of experience. So expat recognition on re-entry is still a challenge for us in the organization. And then the idea of, uh, I've reached the end of my assignment, what happens next? Well, we haven't really thought about that. Uh, so, uh, working with HR on planning a re-entry strategy, which is not only about coaching, but it's getting mentorship and sponsorship on their return. Uh, what I would kind of call global local bridging, so ensuring that there is a flow between the expats uh, and headquarters. Uh, sometimes they feel split between the two. And my favorite cartoon of all is this is Parma, this is the center of the world for pasta, but you have to be umbilically connected <laughs> when you're in space as an expatriate, so you have to be present while absent. And I think that's kind of where we're going, I flick through here. Uh, this is where we're going here, uh, when we get to the Global Players Virtual Forum, which is going to come up in November. Uh, the actual title of that is How to Maintain Strategic Visibility uh, at a Distance. Uh, so how can we ensure that these global players are both present in headquarters while they're absent in places like Australia and, and Hong Kong? And not only, how can we use the expats as ambassadors of an internal internalization process within Marilla? How can we use, uh, can we leverage our, uh, their know-how so that they actually are, it is channeled within this internalization process which Lambert described before? So that's where we're going, that's what we got. I mean, you know, it's all very nice. Uh, the, the basic idea, and, and Lamette is not going to listen to me on this one here, your role as a consultant, in my opinion, is to make the client look good. And uh, I think, you know, this was very good for, for the client. Uh, I mean, we didn't go up there on stage and get the prize or whatever, but it was a collaboration, a partnership together, and I, I think that's good in the relationship, is that you, you also help to build people's careers in organizations too. And if you can do that, that helps the trust, that helps the partnership relationship, and uh, things can be exciting and wonderful. And we don't know what's happening in the future, but it's going to be exciting. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that has been sacked for the project.